was clinically dead for a week. The afterlife is not what you think. It's not heaven, nor is it hell. At first, it was my patient that experienced it. It would be me that followed shortly after. Jason, the one that signed up for this, was concerned. What if you can't bring me back? I sighed. We've run multiple trials, and I can assure you that you're perfectly safe in our hands. We wouldn't do this unless we were absolutely certain we have the tools to bring you back. Jason has incurable cancer. With this experiment, we're attempting to extend his life. Now please continue. I need to know that you understand the process. He took a deep breath before speaking. You're going to want to live me for an entire week in stasis, meaning I won't decay and I'm to report back what I see on the other side. Though his explanation was a bit simplistic, I'm not in agreement. It was a lot to ask, but considering he was already standing at death's doorstep, it might reassure him to know what's awaiting him on the other side. While I was nothing more than a mere physician there to examine the experiment, the professor working over me was a bona fide genius. He developed a cytostatic chamber that was essentially able to freeze dead bodies in time, halting degeneration down to practically zero. Normally, once someone dies, it takes only a few minutes for the brain to stop functioning. But during this time, people frequently experience vivid hallucinations that could be interpreted as a glimpse into the afterlife. What Professor Hall theorized was that a true experience of death only occurs after the brain has lost all neural activity. The issue being that once someone reaches that stage, permanent brain damage would be the inevitable result. Thus the chamber able to halt necrosis until we could bring the subjects back, and our first willing subject would be Jason Moore. Listen, Jason, I know you signed the contract, but you can still back out. There's no shame in being afraid, I said as I put a comforting hand on the shoulder. He shook his head in response. No, no, I need to know. I can't just die without knowing the truth. I nodded and prepared to inject him with cryo serum. This is going to hurt Jason, but only for a moment, I said as I injected the serum in through his fork. A few seconds passed and Jason tensed up in agony. He couldn't move too much due to the restraints, but he still tried his best to get loose. He let out a quick yelp before suddenly falling. Still, his heart had stopped and the experiment had officially begun. We rushed him into the chamber and locked it. A blue gas filled in and his temperature dropped to just above freezing. Any further and the water in his body would expand, rupturing his cells, making his death irreversible. The low temperature combined with the serum would keep him in stasis for the next seven days while we patiently waited, keeping a close eye on his status. EEG and ECG. Readings are negative. He's dead, doctor, one of the assistants said. Keep monitoring him for the next 24 hours. If there's any sign of life, let me know. I ordered the Hall Modified Electroencephalography, or he was a tool specifically designed by Professor Hall to measure electrical activity beyond what we thought was possible and had shown that during brain degeneration, small signals are given off. He'd previously proven that it could not only read signals from the brain, but translate them. Essentially, what he came down to was a tool that could read the unconscious mind. But if Jason was truly dead or in stasis, we shouldn't see anything at all. An absolute confirmation of death. A day passed, and we'd gotten through the crucial stage of Jason's death. If there were to be any complications, they should have already happened, which put us at ease while we waited for the remainder of the week to get by. As we waited, I spent a lot of time by Jason's side. I'd signed up for the program following a near-death experience of my own. Though I had only been legally dead for a couple of minutes, I'd seen a whole world different from our own. Those two minutes were the best of my entire life, and I hate to return, if only vicariously, through someone else. On the fourth day of the experience, we detected a small anomaly in Jason's e greeting. Just a blip, but enough to be concerned. We immediately called Professor Hall for help, asking if the signal could be translated or if the machine had just malfunctioned. He took the readings back to his office and we didn't hear from him for the next two days. As the sixth day rolled around, Professor Hall didn't even show up at the laboratory. Any attempt at calling him was met with an answering machine and we quickly grew concerned by his absence. We then sent one of the researchers to check on him, but his work apartment had been vacated without any clue as to where he'd gone. We were left alone to deal with Jason, who only had one day left in stasis and the anomalous. He had provided us with a continuous signal, which in theory should have been impossible. Yet we proceeded with the experiment. As the seventh day arrived, we counted the minutes until Jason's awakening. We administered adrenaline and a binding agent meant to remove as much as the cryo serum as possible without causing permanent damage. Within a minute we detected a heartbeat, and just a few seconds after that, clear signs of life. All of that accompanied with completely normal egg readings, similar to those of a sleeping person dreaming vividly meant the experiment had been a success. Then we allowed him to rest for 12 hours before waking him up. I sat by his bedside, waiting for him to awake. As desperate as I was curious to finally learn the truth about the afterlife, I almost fell asleep as I noticed Jason's eyes shoot open in chalk. He frantically looked around the room for a few seconds before letting out a blood-curdling scream of absolute horror. Jason, calm down, you're safe. I yelled as I had to hold him down, yet he kept screaming for minutes, alerting the entire laboratory personnel. He punched, scratched, and kept shouting in comprehensible jargon as if he'd forgotten how to speak. Eventually we had no choice but to sedate him while we figured out our next move. In the meantime, some of our co-workers were out looking for Professor Hall, who'd long since been reported missing by his family. 
We ransacked his office and found his notebook containing scribbles and the anomalous he we'd gotten during the experiment folded inside the book. Most of the notes were just frantic writings, hardly related to the he itself, a panic view into Hall's mind the last time he'd been seen. We shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Repeated over and over again without any explanation as to why he left. While no translation was available for the he, Hall had taught me the basics, and with enough effort I managed to get a rough view into Jason's dead mind. I couldn't believe it at first, but I checked again and again and again, and the readings appeared to gather enough thoughts to fill 100 lifetimes, meaning that in the short 7 days Jason had been dead, he'd experienced several thousand years of suffering, enough to render him absolutely insane. After making sure I was reading the translation correctly, I was horrified to learn what Jason had seen on the other side. He'd seen nothing. For thousands of years, Jason had remained conscious on the other side of life in eternal darkness, never experiencing anything other than his own thoughts. They've ran experiments in the past in hedonic chambers devoid of light and sound, and that alone is enough to drive people mad in only a few hours. But Jason had suffered through it for millennia all alone, with no chance of escape. I spent the next weeks looking over old records left behind my hall, where he'd recorded he of deceased individuals as they decayed while their readings were harder to interpret due to the nature of necrosis. With Jason as a control, I could determine that everyone ends up in the same place once they die. A world which is nothing more than a lonely void occupied only by yourself and your deteriorating consciousness for all of eternity. Life is all there is, and death is utter conscious emptiness. There's nothing on the other side, no hell, no heaven, just nothing. And nothing is far worse than death itself.